I'm also calling in from Northern Virginia. I live in the um, Washington DC suburbs, but the kind of Western suburbs. I live in Loudoun County and um, my name is Ann Bradley. I'm an economist. Uh, and my favorite thing to do is teach and to be in the classroom. And this is our virtual classroom. So I'm very happy to be here with you. Um, I, I know this is a partnership with FIDA Foundation for Economic Education. And I've been teaching with FEE for several years on a variety of different topics. I'm excited to be able to talk about entrepreneurship tonight. Um, just a, like a bigger sense of who I am. I grew up in Washington. Well, again, the Virginia suburbs of Washington, D.C., um, and everybody always talked about policy all the time. And that's kind of what people do. That's what, how, you know, what they do for a living and what they think about all the time. And so I was really interested in ideas, not so much policy, but interested in ideas. Um, I think from a pretty young age, just by the nature of where I grew up. And so I decided I wanted to be an econ major. Um, and I went into college. I'd never taken an econ class. So you're already, if you're in high school and you're talking about these things, you're way ahead of where I was uh, when I was your age. And um, I loved it so much that I just decided this is what I want to do. I want to be a professor and I want to teach economics. And so I went and got a PhD from George Mason University. Um, a little kind of interesting fact maybe about me is that in my research is that when I was in graduate school, um, the September 11th attacks occurred. And so I was encouraged by my professor um, to think about writing an article with him on the political economy of terrorism. So kind of looking at terrorism from an economic perspective, which I did. And um, it really just inspired me to be able to write more about that topic. So my dissertation was actually on the political economy of terrorism, looking at Al Qaeda as my case study. And from then I went to work for the CIA for just a little bit. I was an economic analyst doing terror finance. Um, and now I'm where I uh, always was meant to be, which is um, in the classroom. And so now we're in the virtual classroom and I'm, like I said, thrilled to be here. And so the goal for tonight, I'm going to talk about entrepreneurship, the virtues of entrepreneurship, and just kind of, I want to make the connection between entrepreneurship and economic growth. So we want to make sure that, you know, economists are about the, the why and the how, and we want to make sure that we're thinking about, you know, why is entrepreneurship a good thing? So we can talk about its virtues and what it's connected to in society. So that's what I want to do. And I'm going to talk for a little bit, and then we're going to make sure we save plenty of time for your questions. Um, so make sure that you're thinking of your questions and we have both uh, the Q&A function that you should be able to see at the bottom of your screen and the chat function. And so I'll try to make sure that I'm looking at both of those. I'm going to share my screen. And we will get going. So like I said, I, wanted, I want to talk about um, this connection between entrepreneurship and economic growth. Uh, and, you know, entrepreneurship is a really important part of a flourishing and thriving society, but we kind of have to understand how it gets there, uh, how it starts, what are its causes, and, and even also think about what happens when entrepreneurship can't work the way we want it to. And so I would say to you upfront, there's very significant economic and social consequences when that occurs, when we can't get entrepreneurship to get jump, jump started in an economy. And so we wanna think about the institutions under which entrepreneurship occurs. So here's just a little kind of thought experiment. What I would love for you to do, uh, let me make sure you guys can see it. Can anybody give me a thumbs up or in, in the chat if you can see the make sure. Okay. Okay. So if you can't see the presentation, you might need to adjust your Zoom settings perhaps. Um, but thank you for those of you who are responding. Uh, so I want you to look at this picture for those of you who can see it, this picture, and hopefully if you can't, you'll be able to see it very soon. And you can either type in the chat um, and maybe we'll just stick it to the, to the chat, stick to the chat right now, but I want you to use words that describe what you see in this picture. So when you're looking at this photograph, what do you see? And give, you know, kind of, what are words that you would use to describe what you see? So somebody wrote fresh, an organized marketplace, colors, grocery store, market, capitalism, 
markets and consumer goods, agriculture, prices. Oh, somebody wrote abundance, marketing, the produce section, variety, bananas for two different prices, people making business, fruits. Yeah. So there's a lot of things going on in this picture. And I really like to start our kind of conversation in terms of um, thinking about what happens in a market economy. You know, the big question is, why is it that some people around the world are able to go into, this is of course a grocery store, right? And they can kind of fill their cart. We all have limited budgets, of course, but they can put things in their cart according to their tastes, according to their budget. And that, but some of our fellow human beings across the world really don't have access to grocery stores that are connected to global markets, um, or that access is sporadic and unpredictable. And so we really want to um, think about what that means and why that is. And so when I think about this, some of the, you know, some of the words that you've used are certainly words that I would also use, you know, and it begs a lot of questions about how did the produce manager of the grocery store determine how many apples we should have, right? So there's a lot of varieties of apples here. How do we know? And of course, the other kind of big question when we're thinking about economic growth and entrepreneurship and productivity is that we don't want to have too many and we also don't want to have too few. So we kind of have to kind of engage in trial and error to determine what this, what good is, what good looks like. And I would say, you know, the way economists think about markets is that they are a process. They are always in motion. They are always changing. So what you see as kind of the array of produce today might be different in six months. It might be different in two years as people's taste and preferences, maybe for apples or bananas or oranges change, but also as conditions of scarcity change, these can change. Uh, a couple of things I want to point out here before we leave this slide is that, you know, in a in a grocery store like this, the prices are, are listed for you. You see in the back that bananas have two different prices. I don't know if you can see it, but um, the bananas that have the 59 cent price, they have a little green leaf underneath and it says organic on it. And so banana, organic bananas take a little bit more time and investment to produce than non-organic bananas, which is what yields the price difference. And so there's different choices over what might one say is the same good, right? Um, because there's different preferences over those types of goods. The other thing I wanna point out here is that if you look at what the people in the picture are wearing, it's fairly significant. So one of the things that I kind of, and I didn't take this picture, I found it. This is Wegmans grocery store, which started in New York. We have them in Virginia. It's one of my favorite grocery stores, it kind of has a little bit of everything. Uh, but these shoppers are wearing winter coats. And I'm assuming, again, this picture was taken in a New York Wegmans, probably at a time when you'd be wearing winter coat, which really could be any time from, I would say, September to you know May, potentially. Um, and there's a lot of different degrees of coldness in New York at those times. But what's significant about it is no one really in New York can go, at whether it's January and bone freezing cold, or whether it's May and you need a jacket because you had a cold day, but it's getting warm, no one can go pluck um, you know, a kiwi um, from their backyard and then eat it, right? Because kiwis aren't produced in the United States. Um, we mostly import kiwis. And so the significance of the winter coats is that people, ordinary people are able to choose things and put them in their basket that they can't grow on their own, that they can't, you know, kind of cultivate on their own. So global commerce brings together the investments and the ideas and the, you know, kind of innovations of entrepreneurs across the world. So the last thing I'll say before we leave this slide, it, we leave this slide is that this represents something that's orderly, but not ordained. And what that means is that there's no one, there's no kind of like American czar of grocery stores, right? That's not a um, bureaucratic position or a political position that we hire people for. Even the CEO of Wegmans doesn't know how to make a Wegmans happen, um, meaning building the buildings, hiring the people, filling all the stuff um, from start to finish. It takes a lot of cooperation across millions of people across the globe that don't know each other. So it's orderly, it looks very orderly and organized, right? But it's not ordained from someone's brain and then kind of put into being. So the question is, how do we get entrepreneurship? This is just one example. 
But I think this example is useful because it's international cooperation, which is what most of us benefit from, um, is the international cooperation of lots of entrepreneurs across the world. So this is just a quote from F.A. Hayek, an economist who's pretty important, um, I think, to economics, but he's been very important to my thinking. And this is from his book called The Constitution of Liberty. And he says this, the necessity of finding a sphere of usefulness or an appropriate job ourselves is the hardest discipline that a free society imposed upon us. And I think that there's something very telling about that, which, and this is where entrepreneurship gets really challenging. It's not easy. There's nothing about it that's simple. Um, and it, you know, this is what Hayek is saying is that the burden that's put on individual people in a market oriented society or a free society is the imposition that each of us has to find what we are useful at doing, right? We have to find an appropriate job, a way that we can unleash our human creativity in a productive manner. And so I want us to kind of think about what Hayek means there as we walk through um, kind of some of these ideas together. And then of course, opening it up for questions and we can talk about what you like um, at the end. And so this kind of framework of economic thinking, and I know you've had a couple of lectures that are related to entrepreneurship. So what I want to do with you all tonight is really connected to economics. Um, and so kind of to boil down what economics is in you know, 45 minutes and connected to entrepreneurship is certainly not easy, but I think there's a couple of key ideas that it's important for you to walk away with that I would hope that you would walk away with. And one is just kind of what economics is or what I like to call uh, the economic way of thinking is this idea that it's a model of thinking about human choice under conditions of scarcity. And so uh, Mises is a very famous economist and he talked about um, you know, the human action model. So he said that three things have to hold for humans to make a decision, for them to kind of go from a state of not acting to a state of, of action. And the first is that we experience a state of uneasiness, uh, which means you're uneasy with your current state of affairs, right? You, it doesn't mean you're horribly miserable, it can, but it just means that you're uneasy. You would like conditions to be different. Number two is that we have a vision for a better outcome, right? So you can be uneasy about your current conditions or state of affairs, but you have a vision that that can be different, that you can alter it, that you can change it. And then uh, number three, we take conscious and purposeful steps to get there. This is a very important claim that economists are making about all human beings, conscious and purposeful steps. So to the extent that we can go through mentally this process, we're engaging in the calculus of choice, which is what e e you know, economics is. So all people, are purposeful in their actions, right? They take conscious and purposeful steps to accomplish what they want. So the easiest example would be, I wake up in the morning and I haven't eaten in a long time, which is why we call the first meal of the day breakfast, right? Some people eat breakfast right when they wake up. Some people might not eat breakfast for a couple of hours, but eventually we eat, we break the fast, right? And so the uneasiness is, is there, your body is telling you, sending you signals that you need to fuel it. And you have a vision that you can do that, right? That you can alleviate that hunger. It will be temporary. You won't alleviate it forever by eating one meal, but you can temporarily alleviate it, right? And then you do things that are conscious and purposeful as you deem them appropriate to uh, alleviate the uneasiness. So you eat breakfast, right? And you could eat a whole plate of donuts and that might not be a good idea, but you, know, you might view that as what you want to do in the moment. So in saying it, all of that stuff, we're not saying that people always act in a morally justified way, but what we are saying is that people always act in a purposeful way. They are following their purpose, right? As they deem it appropriate. So this is a really, these are really important characteristics of how humans behave. And so human nature is tied directly to the way economists think about the world. Another really important thinker in economics, which I wanna to tie to this idea of, again, how do we live in a society where lots of entrepreneurs are thinking about how to solve our problems? Because that's a society that you and I can benefit from. Um, so, you know, we want to think about what either fosters that or inhibits it. And so this is Adam Smith. Um, he is considered to be the father of modern economics. I'm not sure if you've already talked about him at all in the other webinars. And I know everybody probably hasn't been to all of them. But he's an important person. Um, his thinking was very important. He 
Uh, his most famous work was published in 1776, um, An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations. And in that book, part of what he does is he really thinks about what is it that motivates people to think about others? Because our first concern is for ourselves. We have individual ambition. Adam Smith would talk about our self-love, right? We love ourselves first. We act according to our needs first. So you're going to eat breakfast, right? You're going to take care of yourself. This doesn't mean that you're always vicious. It doesn't mean that you're evil or even that you're always greedy. It just means that this is the, you know, kind of modus operandi of choice. This is how you make decisions. It can include concern for others. But what Adam Smith understood is that we can't organize society around the way we want people to behave. Rather, we have to organize society around the way people actually are, right? How do they normally behave? They normally behave in a self-interested way. So then how can we think about entrepreneurship, which is, you know, discovery and investment um, towards the future, right? So a lot of entrepreneurs make investments today and they don't make a return on them for many years. And so what are the incentives that are required to get people to do that? And so this is what Adam Smith talked about. And he actually said that the market forces of prices, property rights, and profits and losses were the mechanism that really kind of induced people to serve others in and kind of align that with their own self-interest. So sorry, my, <laughs> you can see the word economic kind of spilled over the line there, I apologize. But basically what I wanted to do is just talk about a few economic realities because we have to be grounded in those to ask these big questions, right? Um, we can't, again, we have to understand the realities of the world that we live in, not the way, you know, some utopian version of kind of what we want the world to look like. And so the first and most important idea in economics is that we live in a world of scarcity and all the economic growth in the world doesn't eliminate scarcity, but it can certainly mitigate our opportunity costs and ease our trade-offs. And that's important for people. And so our resources have multiple and competing ends. As such, every decision you engage in brings a cost. Um, so if I said, hey, everybody, you know, if we were in person and I said, hey, you know, um, does everybody want to go out and get ice cream um, after the talk? And it's on me. I'll buy, you know, I don't know how many people, 170 people ice cream, right? That's going to be a big ice cream bill for me. If I said that and I said, you know, let's let's then all hang out together and eat our ice cream together, it the ice cream might not cost you anything in terms of money, right? I'm not asking you to pay, I'm paying for you, but it costs you your most precious asset, which is your time. So all of our decisions bring costs, and all of those costs impose trade-offs, trade-offs upon us, and we have to figure out and sort out how to engage in productive ways, right? And, and there's a role that entrepreneurship plays in filling this productivity gap. And so I'm gonna, gonna get to that. Another really important idea in economics, besides the fact that we live in a world of scarcity, so we always face trade-offs, is that we are interdependent. So we are finite people and we are limited people, right? You can't be the best at everything. You can't even be good at everything. So our little spheres of what we're good at is, are pretty narrow. And so to this end, what economics teaches us is that people have to find a way to trade. They have to. Um, if you can't, you know, if you're just trying to thrive on your own, you're not going to get very far. So human flourishing is very significantly limited when people can't find ways to cooperate. So I don't know if you all have seen this movie. It's very well worth your time. Um, I'm sure you can get it on Amazon Prime at this point. It's from the early 2000s. I'm not exactly sure what year it came out, but this is Tom Hanks in the movie Castaway. Yeah, Brandon got it, Castaway. It's a great movie. And I actually used to make my econ majors and my principals class watch the movie. And then we would kind of talk about all the economics that fall out of this movie. But here's the basic story, which is that Tom Hanks is a Federal Express executive. It's Christmas Eve. This is Kind of a summary, right? And it, he's proposed to his girlfriend. She said, yes, life is great. And he gets on this cargo plane to go back home. And it's a Federal Express cargo plane. So there's two pilots and Tom Hanks and all these boxes full of packages. And the plane crashes on this remote desert island. And Hanks is the rest of the movie. I mean, that's only the first like 15 minutes. The entire movie 
is based on Tom Hanks' quest to get out of there. He needs to get off the island, desperately, desperate to do it. Um, it's a very immiserating experience that he's, you know, kind of going through, which is ironic because if you look at the setting of the movie, it's beautiful. Like the, the island is a place, if there was a hotel, if there was a grocery store, if there was a movie theater, you would love to go there. But the problem is it's beautiful, but it doesn't have any of those things. And so Tom Hanks has to really struggle and try to figure out how to do a couple of things. He needs to eat every day. He needs to get clean water every day. Um, he needs shelter from the elements every day. And there's always fear that there's an animal or perhaps other people that he hasn't discovered. So there's a lot of threats that he faces every single day. But his big goal is get me off the island, right? It's like a story of entrepreneurship as a party of one, which doesn't work out for him very well. Um, and so he's trying to make a raft and it doesn't work very well. And he's trying to make fire and he eventually gets the fire made and he's very excited about it. He's kind of looks like a caveman jumping around on the island saying, I made fire because it took him so long to figure out how to do it. And so the point of the story is that we can't flourish alone. Economics teaches us that because we are limited agents. And so we have to find a way to cooperate because we are interdependent. That's part of our nature. So if we don't find ways to trade, and what are we trading on after all? We're trading on, you know, other people's skills relative to our skills. How does this happen in a market economy? What I call the three Ps, prices, property rights, profits and losses. That's how markets direct human activity, change, commerce. That's how they direct it. Property rights are essential, they're the core. Without property rights, you don't have incentives for finding out how to use the resources in the most productive way at any given time. And that's always the quest of the entrepreneur. The entrepreneur has some set of resources, right? Land, labor, but the most important economic resource that we have is our creativity. So the entrepreneur has to pair their human creativity with their other assets and resources and find ways to serve others. In a market economy, that's what entrepreneurship is about. Finding new ways to use scarce resources that serve other people. And the system of prices, property rights, and profits and losses are the ways that we do that. So, sorry, I mean, I just, I know that this might seem like a lot, but I wanna show you these graphs and let's just pay attention to the middle graph here. This is a downward sloping demand curve and an upward sloping supply curve. Why do I bring this up? Because in any market, so if you've had econ, You've seen this. If you haven't had econ, don't worry. I'm going to explain it in just a few minutes and we're going to move on. So this kind of intersection of the supply and demand curve here is what we call the equilibrium. So we can go over um, to the vertical axis and find the price and we can go down to the horizontal axis and we can whoops, find the quantity. And so when the supply curve and the demand curve meet, we have a market equilibrium. The demand curve is represented by individual people that demand or choose to buy that thing. And it's related to price, right? As the price goes up, people want less. As the price goes down, the quantity demanded increases. The opposite is true for the supply curve. It has an upward slope, which means that as the price of the good goes up, the supplier is more willing to go to market, right? Because they benefit. So think about it this way. Suppliers and demanders have opposite ideas of what they want the price to be. Think about consumer goods that you buy on a regular basis. Maybe you go to the coffee shop in your town, Starbucks or something with your friends and you buy a frappuccino or a latte or something like this, right? As a consumer, you want the price to be as low as possible. But as the franchise owner you know, of the local Starbucks, that owner wants the price to be as high as possible. And so it's the intersection of the supply and the demand curve that is the bringing together of the two parties who have different interests. But note what happens here is that this is a cooperative process when you have the three Ps, meaning when this is predicated on property rights. And that leads to a whole other discussion. Um, maybe we can get into some of that in the Q&A, which is that the rule of law is required for all this, right? A codification of norms around property rights and all those kind of things. When we have, when the price is well above the market equilibrium, we have too much, right? And when we have the prices below the market equilibrium, we have a shortage. And so prices move in a market economy, they adjust to bring together the most willing suppliers and the most willing demanders at any given time. And the entrepreneur, they're the people at the heart of all of this, right? Along with the consumers, 
the entrepreneur has a couple of jobs. So the consumers, we're the people that want the stuff, right? We want the frappuccinos, we want the lattes, but we also want really, you know, maybe we would call those trivial things, but we want other things too. We want, um, you know, we want pacemakers and we want vaccines and we want all sorts of pharmaceuticals that allow us to live longer, healthier lives. So there's a lot of things that the market economy is capable of bringing to people and entrepreneurs play a pivotal role in that. So the first thing that the entrepreneur has to do is discover prob, you know, kind of discover what the problems are out there. What do people want? What do people need? And what are the gaps in, you know, people being able to get those things? So the entrepreneur has to be outwardly focused, again, in a market economy. In a non-market economy, this is very different. And again, perhaps in the Q&A, we can talk about the distinction, but I kind of want to talk about the virtues of entrepreneurship right, in the market process. Um, and so they have to identify problems. The entrepreneur just can't say, I'm gonna sell you this because I say you need it. <laughs> we actually have to need it and want it. So the second role is the entrepreneur has to take risks. They don't know if we're gonna want it at the price that they're able to deliver it to us. And so the entrepreneur has to figure out not only what we want, but how we want it and the price that we're gonna be willing to pay for it. So it's a very risky endeavor. And keep in mind, most things you don't have an immediate turnaround. So that entrepreneur has an idea. If it's something like pharmaceutical or technological innovations, it can take years to develop. And so these things aren't instantaneous. And so the entrepreneur in many cases can have their money on the table or in that investment process for a very long time before they reap a benefit. And one of my kind of favorite economists says that the hardest part of what an entrepreneur has to do is to predict future prices. And so I want you to maybe, maybe the example here that I like to think about, but there's others, I think, is the iPad, right? So this is a technology that's been with us maybe for about 11 or 12 years. I could have not exactly the right time frame on that, but something like that. And when you think about the iPad, when it first came out, right, when it was first available for sale, so that was 10, 11, 12 years ago, um, you know, it's not like the day before Apple decided that they were going to put this thing into practice and then the next day consumers get an iPad, right? It was probably an idea that was brewing for a very long time, years. And so Apple had to put a lot of money into the development, into the R&D, into the trial and error, into focus groups, into marketing, and into manufacturing and production. There's many, many aspects of the long entrepreneurial process. I think we tend to think of entrepreneurs as, you know, these superstars who have these big ideas, but there's a long um, window of discovering that happens. And so it's a long time between you have the idea to you get your first sale of the item, right? And so the hard part for, the, for Apple in that moment is this is a product that's never exactly existed before. It's going to take us a while to bring it to market and we have to figure out what people are willing to pay for something they really have never had before. That's a very tricky thing. And I'll tell you, I think when the original iPads came off the shelves, they were selling for about $1,500 um, and they were flying off the shelves. They actually had to, had to open more manufacturing plants so that they could keep up with consumer demand, which tells me as an economist, what did they do with the price? They actually set the price too low, perhaps, for the quantity that they had, right? So entrepreneurs don't know. They have to guess. They have to make their best educated guess. Uh, but it's not easy what they're doing. And they could fail. I mean, the iPad could have not worked out, right? Um, had it had certain uh, design issues or things like this. And of course, now we've evolved. And iPads are very different than they were 10 years ago, um, but they're better and uh, they have more memory and all these types of things. So the entrepreneurial process is always in motion, but it's about kind of finding the needs of others and filling them and serving them. So entrepreneurship has to be about creating value, right? That's how entrepreneurs serve strangers in a market economy. They have to create value where there wasn't value being created. This doesn't mean that I, you know, it's all, it's not always the iPad example where you're going from nothing, this thing that has never existed to now we have it, but lots of entrepreneurship is about innovations on things that are already happening, right? So we have to create value and it's not always even about a thing. It can be about a process, a technological process, a manufacturing process that lets us do more with the scarce and limited resources that we have. That is how entrepreneurship is tied to economic growth. In societies that have lots of entrepreneurship, incentives around, hey, take your money, put it on the table, 
and develop products and services that consumers want, when that process works well, we get a lot of economic growth and that lifts people out of poverty. And so this is really important stuff, right? Entrepreneurship isn't just kind of what should I do after college? Um, it's, it's about, it's connecting to kind of really thinking about eliminating global poverty. So I think those ideas are very much connected. Uh, but the role of the, what the entrepreneur has to do is they have to learn and they have to discover, right? And so I just put a few examples, right? And maybe these aren't even the best examples when I kind of, as I, I'm talking, because these are really big entrepreneurs. These are entrepreneurs who made it really to the top. Right. And so the, the three people here are you have Sam Walton, who's the founder of um, Walmart, uh, Ray Kroc, who is the founder of McDonald's and Jeff Bezos, who actually just retired. Right. Because he's now off into new ventures. And so he created Amazon. And so these are the kind of people that have made the cover of Time magazine. And I, I do want to dispel the, dispel the notion. I have other examples that, um, you know, entrepreneurs don't don't always make the cover of Time Magazine and they don't have to, to be useful. Uh, but what they do have to do is discover what people need and deliver it to them. And I will tell you that the process of entrepreneurship is a lot of trial and error. And so if you think about somebody like uh, Kroc who founded McDonald's, you know, he stumbled into this opportunity based on something else he was doing. He was going door to door to restaurants that were on the side of highways. This is a long time ago. And he was selling um, milk, milkshake mixers. So um, he was selling this device to restaurants. Uh, and then kind of he um, basically found McDonald's, which hadn't been a huge franchise at the time. And he revolutionized the process of making the fast food. And so that was his innovation. Walton with Walmart, really kind of an interesting story as well. His idea was that we should take big box stores, which is what we call them now, right? And we should put them in rural communities. Uh, he actually had this idea with a company that he was working for prior to founding Walmart and he, it was kind of considered not a good idea. Um, and so he went to his parents or his family, I'm not exactly sure of the details, and he asked for a loan and he started this in Arkansas. And you can imagine living in Arkansas, maybe some people I didn't look at, I wasn't able to see everybody's response, but maybe we have people who are hailing from Arkansas tonight. But if you're in a remote location, no matter what state it is, that's just where um, he was living. You know, going to the grocery store could be a day long affair, especially back in the sixties, right? So you might have one family car, you get to the grocery store, it, it might be a couple of hours away to get to a large department store. And, you know, it takes a lot of time and then you don't get to go as often. And so his idea was that people in rural communities will benefit from having big box stores where you have groceries and home goods and all these types of things. And so that was an innovation, right? Jeff Bezos wanted to sell books online. Now, you know, what doesn't Amazon deliver to your doorstep? It delivers a lot of things, right? And so he was able to expand that business by tapping in um, to a need. It has to be value creation though. People have to want it and not just one person can want it. Like lots of people have to want this for you to have that type of success. And so entrepreneurs then are gonna have to evolve and change with changing consumer needs, changing consumer wants and changing consumer incomes. And so that's gonna drive what they do and how they operate. So this is an example of what I like to call micro entrepreneurship. And I have to tell you, this is my, this is a picture of my cousin. So if you're in um, DC, he runs this food truck called the big cheese. And his story is kind of an interesting one. Uh, but I wanted to, I wanted to use it because remember, I said, you know, those guys are on the, that I showed you before, they're on the cover of Time magazine, and they're great. Um, you know, they've done things that are remarkable, but not all, all entrepreneurship starts at a micro level. And so this is my cousin. He worked in DC for many years in the restaurant business and he really wanted to open his own brick and mortar restaurant, but DC has become quite a foodie town and real estate's quite expensive. And so he just realized he wasn't gonna be able to do that. So about 10 years ago, maybe a little, maybe 12 or 13 years ago, he said, I'm, I'm gonna start a food truck. And so he got this box truck and he got it you know, fitted so that it has a grill inside. He was at the beginning of the stage of his entrepreneurship, he was assembling grilled cheese sandwiches in his apartment in Arlington, Virginia, and kind of wrapping them in the wax paper and then putting them in a cooler. And then he would go to different locations in DC. 
Well, it turns out that's not a really good idea because it, it's a violation of um, the health inspection rules. So then what he decided to do was to rent space from a, a pre-existing restaurant. So he would go to an Italian restaurant every morning at like 9 a.m. and he would rent five square, you know, kind of five feet of their stainless steel counter. And because they were a certified kitchen, he was able to make his grilled cheeses there, wrap them up, put them in the cooler, put them in the truck. And so he had to innovate and change what he was doing. And when he first started, I remember going to see him and it was like 45 minutes to get a grilled cheese sandwich. And I just remember being in line thinking, this better be a good grilled cheese because we're waiting a long time. And the reason we had to wait so long is because he was a one man show. He was making the grilled cheese, you know, wrapping it, getting people drinks, getting them a brownie, taking their credit card payments, all these types of things. It's very hard for one person. So the wait was really long. It wasn't until he was able to get a little revenue going that he was able to hire an employee, right? So there's a really deep connection too between entrepreneurship that does tap into what people want and need and jobs, right? Jobs are a, a, a symptom of economic growth, not, not so much the source of economic growth. And what I'm trying to say there is that when you have economic growth starting to snowball, you get a lot of jobs. And this is the story behind that, right? He had to do it up by his own or on his own at the beginning. But then once he got going and got a little revenue, was able to save up a little cash, then he was able to hire someone and then it didn't take 40 minutes to get the grilled cheese. And, you know, I'm happy to report he's still doing this today. And I think he has two food trucks. So, you know, my, that's where entrepreneurship starts. I think there's lots of stories we can tell about entrepreneurship over the past 18 months. We've lived through a pandemic. It's been a very challenging time. And this is a story that I read about in the Washington Post. And I think it's a really fascinating story about how entrepreneurs have to pivot, right? We use that word a lot this year, pivot, how they have to change on a dime, adapt to new circumstances. So this is the story. This is a woman who opened a pop-up shop near her college in Washington, DC. And you can probably remember back to last April or so when everybody needed hand sanitizers and gloves and masks, um, and we didn't have access to them, right? It was hard to find hand sanitizers, really hard to find gloves, really hard to find hand, you know, Clorox wipes, all that kind of stuff. So there were certain things that we were having a hard time getting as consumers. Well, her father uh, is a cancer patient and has been for many years. And so as a cancer patient, he has lots of hand sanitizer and apparently a lot, a lot of gloves for his in-home treatment. You know, every time a nurse or whoever would come in, they would just leave him all these bottles of hand sanitizer and gloves. And I don't know what else he had. And she talked to her father and said, you know, can we take some of this excess that we have and open a pop-up shop? So they did that and it made the front page of the Washington Post. Why? This is fascinating, right? Because imagine if she had said to her dad in October of 2019, before there was a pandemic that we at least knew about, right? Before things got really bad. If she said, hey, dad, can I have some of your supply? I'm going to open a pop-up shop and I'm going to sell hand sanitizer and gloves. People would have thought that was very weird, right? Because you could just go to Target or CVS or you could order on Amazon. You could get all those things. There was no shortage and we didn't have an increased demand for them. But everything changed when the pandemic hit us, right? So entrepreneurs have to pivot in that way. Now, did she become a multimillionaire with this? No, I doubt it. I haven't seen a follow-up article. But the point is that she was able to take leftover resources that she had and transform them into consumer goods based on a change in circumstances. That's what entrepreneurs have to do. They have to be alert to opportunities. And so that's, again, an example of micro entrepreneurship that I think is really important. So I'm just going to ask, and you can type it in the chat. And I'm just going to say, if you know who Henry Turkle is, say yes. Um, so you can type in yes. If you don't know who Henry Turkle is, you can say no. And I'm going to come back to that in a few minutes. Um, but you can just briefly type in the chat if you want. Yes, I know who he is. Or no, I've never heard that name. Um, so it looks like I'm getting a bunch of no's. So I'll let you respond for a moment. Yep, we have a lot of no's and that's okay. I'm gonna, t I'm gonna fill you in in a minute. This is, this is a picture of him. I don't know if that makes it more clear, um, but this is Henry Turkle. So 
I'm going to come back to Henry Turkle and why he's important. And this is, and that's going to, that's what I'm going to end on the virtuous aspect of entrepreneurship. Okay. So the other element of entrepreneurship that's really important is that it leads to what we call in economics, progressive cheapening of goods and services. So does anybody know what this is a picture of? It's actually a famous movie. Anybody know who that is or what movie? type it in if you know. Um, this is, it dates me because it's a movie from the 80s. Um, no, not Back to the Future, but that's actually not a bad guess. This is from the movie Wall Street. Um, and so that's uh, Michael Douglas and he's the head, the lead character and his name is not accidentally um, Gordon Gecko, right? So he's a hedge fund manager on Wall Street and he's evil and that's his portrayal in the movie. But the important point here is that in the bottom picture, this is a, a Hollywood portrayal of an evil hedge fund manager in the 1980s, right? And so this picture is taken when he's walking along the beach, he's at his Hamptons house. It's like this very modern 80s, you know, modern in the 80s <laughs> mansion. And he's walking along the beach holding that phone. And, you know, in 1984, you were a very wealthy person if you hold that phone. Right now, if you held that phone, it would be like funny, right? Maybe you would be part of a Halloween costume or maybe you would um, see it in a pawn shop or a museum, right? But nobody, especially wealthy people do not carry phones around like this, right? And the, the reason we might ask that is, or we might say, why is that? And so this picture, the second picture that I popped up here is the Nokia brick. And I have to tell you, again, I'm old. Um, I had this phone when I went to graduate school in the early 2000s. I was extremely proud of myself when I saved up for this phone. I think it cost me $80 in 2000 or 2001, whenever I got it. And this phone did almost nothing, right? So it barely held calls. <laughs> you could text, but if you can see here, the picture is a little grainy. The number two are letters A, B, and C. So if you want to get the C, you have to type number two, three times. So like there was no texting and driving because it was just way too dangerous. So that was the Nokia, right? So this is like the 1984 phone in the bottom. This is the early 2000s phone, right? And then some version of this is what you and I carry around, right? So I have one right here um, and I can do all sorts of things on that thing, right? I can use it as my alarm clock in the morning, which I do. I can check email, I can check the weather, I can check the news, I can order books, I can get my groceries delivered, I can get my dry cleaning picked up all from that thing. It's amazing, right? This phone that Michael Douglas is holding in the movie in 1983 or four, whenever the movie came out, that thing I think had to charge for about 24 hours. Um, and I think it held its charge for about 30 minutes. So this is like not even very helpful, right? And it's in kind of the suitcase thing that you have to carry around. So economist um, Schum named Schumpeter called this the process of creative destruction. Entrepreneurship is about destroying the old way we do things and bringing forth the new way, right? So the difference between the top picture and the bottom picture is really remarkable. But what I wanna tell you about this progressive cheapening is that it brings things that people value to more people. So market economies have this egalitarian effect that happened through the process of entrepreneurship, which is in the 1980s, you had to be a very wealthy person. I believe, by the way, I could have my story a little bit wrong, but the, the numbers are right. In 1984, the first mobile phone, uh, mobile cellular phone was sold. And I believe it cost about $4,000 in 1984, which would be like $10,000 now. So you had to be a very wealthy person in the early 80s to have basically what amounts to not a very good phone today, right? It's the phone again that you see in the you know museums or something. Now the phone that we, is on the top, it costs a lot, right? Like our you know fancy iPhones cost like a thousand dollars, but they don't even have anything in common with the phone on the bottom, do they? I mean they're both called phones. That's about it, right? <laughs> the top one you don't have to charge it that long. Um, it does a lot of stuff for you other than just making calls. You can text, you can get directions, all sorts of things, right? So this is the progressive cheapening of goods and services that occurs through entrepreneurial innovation. This is why entrepreneurship is so essential for economic growth. So we're destroying the old way of doing things. We're ushering it out. We put that old phone out of business, right? Through consumers and demanders really coming together 
and consumers saying, I want more, I want more, I want more. And so what do entrepreneurs have to say? Let me figure it out, let me figure it out, let me figure it out. And so the, the last little picture here is just to say that really this is helping make big strides in po poverty alleviation across the world. So this was kind of a really interesting um, New York Times article that came out in 2007. And it's really showing that access to cell phones is, is transforming the underdeveloped world and giving people micro entrepreneurship opportunities. So basically this often uh, applies to women. Women will save up with their, their husbands and their families to buy a phone. And then they will go to the center of their village or their town and they will sell minutes because not everybody has a phone. But if you know somebody has a phone, right? Great for you. But if you don't know a friend that has a phone that's willing to let you use it, this is again, more micro entrepreneurship that brings people together and gets them connected. And so I mentioned this egalitarian aspect of wealth creation that happens through entrepreneurship in a market-based society. We don't wanna play this game of having to figure out how to divide the pie. You know, uh, people say this all the time, like the economy is a pie. I don't actually love that analogy because if pie is fixed, and the economy isn't fixed. The economy, if it's allowed to grow, will grow through entrepreneurship, right? So we don't want to live in a world where there's a fixed set of resources, because then what does the battle be, become? Well, who's going to divide the pieces of the pie and do I get a piece? And that leads to very inegalitarian results and exploitation and plunder and cronyism and bribery and theft and all that kind of stuff. And of course, today, there are societies that are dominated by that type of kind of zero sum game transacting. And those are the societies that perform worse in terms of the metrics we have for entrepreneurship. So what we wanna think about is that pie getting bigger, it's always growing, right? So economies are not stagnant, they can increase and decline. Entrepreneurship can be part of the process that helps the economy grow. But what entrepreneurship does, it doesn't just grow one pie, it gives you more pies, right? <laughs> So the joke up at the top here is that, it, you know, you could walk into a Whole Foods or a Wegmans or a Safeway or any grocery store. It's not just a cherry pie, but there's apple pies and then there's cakes and pecan pies and meringue tarts and this, you know, kind of concoction at the top, sugar-free, gluten-free, dairy-free, egg-free, low fat, right? And my original joke was somebody must want that because it's on the shelf. Um, and then I have to tell you that my son, who's 11, I have an 11 year old son and an eight year old daughter, and my son was diagnosed with celiac disease about three years ago. And we actually couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. His stomach hurt all the time. Um, he ended up also having an ulcer at the top of his intestine, which was caused by the celiac disease. But, you know, it's not just about having preferences for food like this. Market economies deliver desserts to people who can't eat regular desserts, whether you're vegan, whether you have celiac disease, whether you have a peanut allergy, whether you can't have sugar because of your diabetic, there's a thousand reasons for wanting the apple oatmeal cream pie, right? Uh, without entrepreneurship, we don't find ways, not only ways to get that to people, but entrepreneurship reveals the process of discovering that people want that, right? The entrepreneur, it is incumbent upon them to figure out what do people want? And it turns out they want that apple oatmeal crisp that doesn't have any of the stuff in it that you know a lot of people want to avoid. And so markets are bringing that to us through entrepreneurs. Um, here's another result of entrepreneurship in a market-based society, which is that we start to get more consumption equality. Um, I think that phone was one example, but this is another example. So there's economists that have looked at this over time, and this is just one kind of sample I want to share with you. So these here are two stoves. Um, the first stove, let me see if I have the numbers. Yeah. So in 1972, this stove um, cost $395 and it took the average non-supervisory manufacturing laborer. So that's a very specific person, right? So we wanted to, in the economic research, they wanted to target people who were not at the top of the income distribution, right? So non-supervisory manufacturing worker. So in 1972, the stove cost $395. It took 99 work hours, which actually meant that it took a long time for you to be able to save up because you can't just work 99 hours in a row to get the stove, but you also have to pay your rent and go grocery shopping and all this kind of stuff. So it actually takes a lot of your time to save up for this stove, right? So this is a modern version as close as we can get. It doesn't have the 70s mustard yellow and the racing stripe on it, but it's as close as 
these economists who were doing this research found. And in 2015, which was when this study was done, this stove was $349. So if you just compare prices, you might say, well, gosh, the stove was 395 in 1972, 349 today. It really hasn't changed that much, right? But look at the difference. Same worker, non-supervisory manufacturing employee. It now takes that person 16.8 hours of work to get the stove. That's what we want, that process of progressive cheapening, right? It's not just that prices go down, it's that your labor gets more productive. And in a market economy, what happens when your labor gets more productive? You earn more money, right? So that person in 1972 was making like $3 an hour. The same person in 2015 was making about $22 an hour. So again, what we wanna think about when we think about the virtues of entrepreneurship, we're thinking about not just you know, Jeff Bezos is cool because he started Amazon and now he's going into space. No, what we want to think about is the value they're creating and how they are empowering people to be able to consume more, right? And so there has to be a fight to do that. And so what we say in economics is that it's not so much consumers and demanders, I mean, sorry, demanders and suppliers are kind of at odds with one another, but actually suppliers are the ones that are at odds with one another, right? They're competing for your business, again, in a market economy. And that's exactly what we want them to do. It gets us the stoves, it gets us the dishwashers, it gets us the Roombas, it gets us the phones, all the things we want. So when we have a society dominated by lots of entrepreneurial investment and growth, so um, this tends to be very correlated with economic freedom. Economic freedom is something that uh, economists use to measure the openness of markets and commerce and exchange in societies. And so this is a graph that's doing a correlation between economic freedom and what we call entrepreneurial dynamism, right? Looking at new business startups, new investments, you know, is there a lot of activity, entrepreneurial activity in, an, in a country or in an economy? And so what we see is that they're very positively correlated, right? Which means that the more economic freedom a country has, the more entrepreneurship and opportunities for entrepreneurship that that country has. And that's where we get the things we want and we need. So I'm just keeping an eye on the time here because I need to wrap it up in a moment. I'm gonna, I promised I'd tell you about Henry Turkle, but I wanna connect that, um, these last two ideas really quickly here. So this is a big graph that shows us a lot of things. Um, this is GDP per capita over all of human history. I kind of say that laughing because there's a lot jammed into the graph. So this is adjusted for purchasing power differences. It's adjusted for inflation. And I just want you to pay attention to the orange line because what it shows us is that for most of human history, people have lived at subsistence levels. Most economists believe um, based on the, you know, anthropological and archeological data that we've used to dig up these numbers, that most people live between one and $3 per person per day for most of human history. And then we lift off this horizontal line and today every country is richer than it was 50 years ago. Now we still have a lot of work to do in terms of eliminating poverty. And the reason for that is because of the advancement of global commerce and exchange and economic freedom that has occurred in that time. And that's fueled by entrepreneurship, right? So when you live in a society with lots of entrepreneurship, lots of discovery, lots of ideas, lots of risk taking, ordinary people like you and I get to benefit. And so I told you I'd tell you who Henry Turkle is. So I'm gonna end with this quick story and then I'll um, open up for questions. So this is my daughter. I told you she's eight. This was when she was a newborn. And I went, I basically was taken to the hospital at 26 weeks and I stayed there on bed rest until my daughter was born and she was born at 31 weeks. So she was very premature and they were very worried about her. And so when she was a newborn, as you see here, there's a bunch of things preemies can't do and they're all life-threatening. So they can't regulate their own body temperature, they can't eat on their own, um, and they can't regulate their heart rate. So all those contraptions around her, her name is Bailey, are doing those things for her. And I want you to notice her face. There's this little tiny tube, it's taped to her face, it goes in through her nose and it goes down through her stomach. And it's giving her milk because she's just too young. She was three pounds when she was born, so she can't even drink on her own. So this is the only way to keep her alive at the time. And she lived in this incubator for a long time. And so I started, you know, I had a lot of time on my hands at that time because I was on hospital bed rest. 
And I started thinking about that little, you know, tube with the milk in it. And so I did a little research and this is the patent application for that tube. It's an infant nasal feeding tube that was invented by Henry Turkle. And it was the, the patent application um, was filed in 1950 and approved in 1952. Interesting that this was not filed to care for preemies. You know why? Preemies didn't survive in 1952, at least not 31 week old preemies, very rare. This was actually for down, babies with Down syndrome because they have a sucking reflex problem. And so he invented, he had the entrepreneurial idea, right? Why? Because of the work he was already doing. So that's where most entrepreneurship comes from. He was a doctor and he said, these babies can't eat very well. So he developed this infant nasal feeding tube. And look, it's taped right to the baby's face in 1952, just like it was taped to my daughter's face in 2013. And so, you know, I always say it's a kind of very, a very moving story to me because I didn't, well, I couldn't do anything to help her at that time. Uh, but I had to rely on thousands of strangers, not only in the here and now, but innovations that were thought of 60 years before she was alive. And that's the benefit of living in a society with lots of entrepreneurship that's fueled by economic freedom. We get more human flourishing. So as an ordinary person, right, I got the benefit of a hospital with the infant nasal feeding tube, and that saved her life. I mean, it was one of the many things that saved her life. So I think, you know, those stories, we all probably have a story like that, and I think they're very powerful, but a lot of those stories, we tie back to the power of entrepreneurship. Again, how do we think, how do we induce entrepreneurs to discover new and better ways to do things and to serve strangers? So I'm going to stop there, um, and if you have questions and you want to type them in the Looks like Grace is asking us for the, in the Q and A window that I'm going to look at some and answer. So just type away. Um, okay, so Rafaela has a question. It's a great one. Uh, what is the biggest difference between a market economy and a non-market economy? I think this is a really important question. So remember, I talked about the three P's. In a market economy, that's how resource allocation occurs. So. In a market economy, some people call it capitalism. I noticed one person wrote that, at least one person, as the answer to what they saw in the picture of the grocery store, right? Um, capitalism, the, the way economists refer to that word, I think that word has a lot of mixed meanings or mixed signals to people. Capitalism is an economic system uh, dominated by the private ownership of the means of production, which means private individuals own the resources and then they decide what they're gonna do with them. A non-market economy or, you know, kind of a socialist economy is collective ownership of the means of production, which means we own it together. There's no private property rights, but we collectively own goods or land or, or capital. And so we, we're not then using prices, right? Prices only come about because we have property rights and because we have that exchange between consumers and demanders. So in a non-market economy, because we're deciding together, not deciding investment and entrepreneurship through private ownership, we have to put people in charge to help us know what to do. And that's really where those types of non-market economies tend to have a lot of problems. And the problems emerge because nobody knows what to do. See, like, well, I guess another way I could say that is right now, it's 2021, right? In 2025, we have no idea what the optimal allocation of scarce resources should be for our country or the globe. We don't know. But between now and 2025, entrepreneurs are going to learn that and they're all going to learn that individually. So there's no collective kind of basin of knowledge that we can rely on to plan economies. So I hope that helps answer your question, but it's really an important question because that what that means is that entrepreneurship takes different forms in different types of economies, right? So what we've been talking about is productive market entrepreneurship that creates value. I think the problem is in non-market economies, you have a different type of entrepreneurship. Um, and so that's entrepreneurship around bribes, you know, or what we call political entrepreneurship, which is how do you try to get to the top of the political system so that you can be the person that's making the decisions, right? Because remember, if we have a fixed pie, then what really matters is who is in charge because how they're gonna divide up the pie really matters, right? But if the pie is growing and prices and profits and losses are the mechanism that decides who gets what, 
then as people's income grows, everybody gets more. That's what you want. Now, markets don't work perfectly. So we don't, you know, economists, I think, need to be careful not to make those kind of claims. But you asked about the differences in how those two things work, right? And so I think um, hopefully that answered your question. Um, okay, so let me let me look at another question here. Okay, if you have an idea for a product that will serve customers, or excuse me, consumers, what are the steps to build the product? Is it taking, you know, it to manufacturers first? And I, you know, I, so Freddie asked this question. It's a good question, Freddie, and I'm not actually, that I joked with Grace before this, I'm not actually an entrepreneur. I just think about them. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think it, it's very industry specific, and I think it depends on what the innovation is. And so if it's, you know, if it's your, your kind of specific question is I have a product, right? Um, I don't think you can even take it to manufacture to the manufacturing process first. I think there's a couple of things that have to happen. Sometimes you need to have a patent for the, for the item, um, depending on what it is, which provides you some insulation in the short term. There's a lot of debate about whether, you know, how good are patents. I think they provide some, um, they provide some benefits. Uh, in a market economy, but I think that, you know, in the limit, maybe they can be restricted too. So maybe that's a different conversation. But basically, I don't even think you can go to a manufacturer first. I think number one, you have to have, do I have a unique idea and do I have anybody that's willing to fund it? So I don't know if you guys have watched the show Shark Tank, but to me, Shark Tank is such a great example of how this stuff works in the real world. Now, obviously it's a show, right? We don't all get to meet the sharks every time we have an idea. Um, but I think that what are the sharks doing? They're investors, right? And so you, they're the people with money and you need them to think that your idea is scalable. And so you need to get money from some type of investor or you may need a lot of entrepreneurs take um, a second mortgage out or something they use their home as collateral, their land as collateral. So there's a lot of ways to do it. But I think before you even take something to a manufacturer, you have to have some focus group research to kind of understand, do people want this, right? Because I think we can really fall victim to the idea that, oh, I have this great idea. That means people are going to want it. And, and we, that's not always true, right? We could think it's a great idea, but we have to, for anybody to invest in it, it has to be an idea that other people want. And that's to me the beauty of watching the show Shark Tank is they're, they kind of are trying to judge whether that product or service is going to have any demand. And they're not always right. I mean, they're just, they're just human beings, right? They just have a lot more experience. Um, and so that's what a lot of people do. So I, I was part of a conference in the middle of COVID that we did over Zoom and it was about entrepreneurship during the time of COVID. And I was able to do an interview with an entrepreneur who opened his first, God bless him. I mean, he opened his first restaurant in like March um, in DC and DC was very strict with their, um, their kind of lockdown rules. And so this could be the death of his business and he had all these investors and all this money on the line. And so his story was a really neat one. It was a very high-end restaurant. One of the, this is just um, an interesting story. But one of the things he did was he had, he offered ceviche for sale. And so, because, you know, you can't really do ceviche to go very well. Um, I guess he felt that the quality would suffer. So you could ask the chef to come to your house the chef would go in your kitchen, you would be in another room to, you know, have the social distancing and the chef would make you homemade ceviche and then leave. And so that's not ideal, right? You're not going to get a lot of people who are going to be able to afford to pay for that, but it kept him afloat um, during the pandemic and during the lockdown and it kept his investors happy. So, you know, I think pivoting is the name of the game, but that's just a, that's just a kind of example I wanted to share with you, but I don't even, I guess the bottom line is it's not just about the manufacturers. It's about do we have enough people who are behind this that we can now make an investment in it? And then prototypes, focus groups, and then some limited manufacturing, and then see if that scales up. But I also think it um, depends on the industry. So Michael has a great question, I think. And again, I'm an economist, um, so I don't know if I'm the best to answer your question, Michael, but I'm going to try. What is one of the best tips you can give us about how to look for the best opportunity for an entrepreneur? So I'm just going to talk like an economist here because that's what I do. That's what I know. And I would say you have to think about what it is you love to do um, and 
focus on that first. So in economics, we would call that your, you know, not, not just what you love to do, but what you're relatively better at doing than other people. Um, that's where you need to focus, right? So don't, you know what, I think what people have the misconception that if we're talking about entrepreneurship, it's like we're in a restaurant ordering off a menu and you can pick anything. And that's not the case, right? We're not all good at the same things. We don't all have the same attitudes towards risk. So I would first think about what do you love? What do you do well in at school? What can you see yourself doing in the future? And I, you know, think along the lines of industry, you know, are you good at accounting? Are you good at coaching? Are you good at, you know, there's a lot of different things you could think about and then think about innovation in those arenas because that's bringing your skills to the industry and then saying, how can I be entrepreneurial in that um, field, right? That's different than just saying, you know, what's going to make me the most money and then like trying to figure that out. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs fail because they think about that. And yeah, I mean, if you have something that creates value, you can make a lot of money. But I also think you have to be good at it, right? You have to be able to do it. And so for me, how, how could I be an entrepreneur? Well, maybe I could run Zoom econ boot camps um, during a pandemic. That's micro entrepreneurship. Is it going to make me on the cover of Time Magazine? No, but it's already what I do, right? And it's an adaptation of what I've done before. And if there's a demand for it, I might be able to sell that to people, right? So that's just like a little example from my life, but we all have those examples. So that's to me how I would think about honing in on that big question. It has to be about something that you're not just passionate about, but that you think you can do well relative to others and then bring your innovative ideas to that, um, to that topic or to that industry. Uh, and then, you know, for the entrepreneurs I showed you guys before, I mean, these guys tried a billion things. Um, and so they fail a lot before they make it that big. And so I think to be an entrepreneur, you can't be somebody who gives up really easily. You have to try something new, try something new, try something new. And that's hard. And so it's not for everybody, right, in terms of owning your own business. But I think that even if you don't own your own business, the spirit of entrepreneurship can be infused in your work, right? Which is just, how do I, how, how, how can I be better at my job by finding new ways to do, you know, to do things? So I hope that helped. Um, answer your question. Um, okay, Josue says, why are property rights important for the flourishing of an economy? This is an important question, so I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on it. And the idea here is that property rights provide us with incentives. So if I own something, it's not just that it tells me that I own it, but it also helps me understand what I don't own, what I don't have the rights to. And so property rights in a society create a boundary. And within that boundary now, we have an incentive to put that resource to its most productive use. The opposite is what we call in economics, the tragedy of the commons, which happens when nobody owns something. So the classic example that's given in economics is you have an open field, right? And you have a lot of kind of farmers that are near that open field. The open field has resources that you can use. For example, it has a meadow where your cows can eat the grass. And so I might send my cows to eat the grass because it means they're not eating my grass, right? So my cows go onto the field, but then the other farmer next to me does the same thing. They're like, well, I'm just gonna eat, I'm gonna send my cows out into that open pasture. And so when everybody does that, because nobody owns it, you can't exclude people from it, right? And so what happens in the tragedy of the commons is that we destroy the resource, we plunder, we, we use it all up. So that field, which was lush and vibrant, becomes barren because nobody had the incentive to make sure that the grass was always being cultivated for future use. So the property right gives us an incentive not only to use the scarce resource in the most productive ways now, but to make sure that resource doesn't get depleted into the future. So a lot of you I know are calling in from, from Georgia, right? Georgia Pacific is a company in your state and you know they make paper products. So they own a lot of, um, fields of acres of forest, right? I'm sure they outsource some of that too, but they definitely own acreage. And what, what is their incentive? Because they own it, they don't just wanna make money from the toilet paper they sell you today. They wanna make money this year and next year and the next year and the next year. So if you look at that, those forests, there's all sorts of different life cycles of the trees because they wanna be able to harvest today, 
next year, the next year, the next year. That incentive goes away if they don't have an ownership right to the property. So that's why it's so essential. As the rule of law in a society gets eroded and private property rights are done away with, then you have the tragedy of the commons where people just start to plunder, they start to steal, they start to overuse the resource. So in, in societies that don't have well-defined property rights, we actually see a lot more pollution, things like this, because there's no property rights to exclude other people, to minimize pollution, right? So, so no society has zero pollution, um, but it's excessively bad when you don't have constructive property rights uh, regime that's upheld by a court system. So I think that's such an important question. I hope I, I answered it for you. Um, Anthony asks, when referring to supplier competition, do you mean a competition of prices for the consumer? So uh, let me clarify that. That was back to my supply and demand curve graphs. Suppliers are competing against each other for your business and demanders are competing against each other for the stuff. So let me explain both of those. So, you know, we just had the 4th of July and, the, and you know, holidays are a great excuse for retailers to have a sales, right? And so you can get like, you know, people have mattress sales and TVs go on sales and all these th things go on sales around on sale around holidays. Well, Macy's would like to sell you a mattress, but so would, you know, all these box mattresses that you can get delivered to your door. There's lots of suppliers competing. And what are they competing on? They're competing on the margin of your business. So Macy's is competing with Casper for you, you know, who are you going to buy the mattress from? So Macy's is competing with other mattress retailers. On the demand side, right, there's a limited amount of stuff on any shelf at any time. So buyers are competing with each other in terms of the stuff on the shelves. It's the interaction of the demand curve that slopes downward and the supply curve that slopes upward that gives us the equilibrium price at any given time. And so really the equilibrium price in a market economy, because you asked about prices, comes from that competition or the interaction between the suppliers and the demanders. So I guess the way to think about suppliers as they pertain to demanders is that they have opposite ideas about what they want for the price, right? Because the supplier wants the price to be high and we as consumers want the price to be low. It's that bargaining over price that gets you to that equilibrium. That's a really important question because it shows us that entrepreneurs in a market economy, they don't have kind of all encompassing power. Now, economists worry about monopolies, of course, and if you've taken econ, you might've already started talking about that. Monopolies have more power to control quantity and more power to control price. Um, and so that's why as economists, you know, when we see the potential of monopoly, we get worried and we start to ask questions about why is this monopoly there? Why is it persistent? What could we do about it? But in general, outside of pure monopolies, which are not, you know, normal, um, that, that's what's going on. So suppliers are competing against suppliers, demanders are competing against demanders, and suppliers and demanders are negotiating on prices. So that was a great question. Um, I hope that helped. Okay, let's see. Out of all the virtues of entrepreneurship, which virtue would be considered the highest? Um, so to me, and I, I thought I saw some other questions. I'm trying to make sure I can answer as many as possible. I, you know, I think that the virtue is that the process of entrepreneurship in a market economy means that we get self-interested people to think about how to create value for other people. So to me, I mean, maybe that's too broad. You ask for one thing, <laughs> but I think it's the value creation right? It's that um, these entrepreneurs have to be, they have to answer to us as consumers. They have to do what we want. They don't always know what we want. They guess a lot, right? Uh, and we hold them accountable on a lot of different margins. But the value creation piece to me is really important. And that's why when I go back to that first grocery store picture, is that the right amount of apples? I mean, there was a lot of apples there, right? It must have been fall, and I think that apples up at the front of the picture were New York apples. So those, that's the local produce, right? So there's a lot going into those decisions that the produce manager makes of any given grocery store about how many apples should we have. But it's a process of discovering, right? In, in other words, what I'm saying is nobody gets that answer right on the first try. And in addition to that, the answer always changes. 
right? Because consumers' tastes and preferences change and all sorts of stuff changes, right? And so that's going to always the entrepreneur has to kind of guess, re-guess, relearn, rediscover, and that's their job. So I think to me, um, it's the it's the value creation. Okay, Cameron asks, how does economical success differ between an individualist and collectivist culture? This is a great question. So I'm going to kind of try to parse through some of what you, what I think you're asking here. Um, you know, we're all individualists. So when we say individualist culture versus collectivist culture, I think what you mean is a culture that views individualism as a, as a positive thing, right? And by individualism, I think what most people mean there is that individual people are free to choose what they want. That doesn't mean you have unlimited freedom. Like I can't punch you in the face and then take your wallet, right? So that would be a violation of property rights, ethos and law. Uh, and that's a good thing, right? So I don't have unlimited desires to satisfy my you know, impulses. But then in an, an individualist society is the, the society that's kind of committed to human agency and human dignity and understands that individuals are the ones that are choosing and we want them to be able to have lots of choices. So that's my interpretation of how I would say that. Um, kind of a collectivist culture, again, it's kind of going back to the examples of the market versus non-market economy that we went over before as well, which is to say that in collectivist culture, it doesn't mean that just because the economics of the society are collectivist, that people are not individuals, right? And so that's why, market economies tend to work better because they're predicated on the truths of human nature, which is we're all individualists and we all care about ourselves first, always. Now that doesn't mean we're all jerks all the time, but it means we have these tendencies towards corruption, towards greed, all this kind of stuff. Collectivist cultures just mean we're deciding that nobody's gonna privately own things and we're gonna collectively decide. But the ironic outcome of collectivist cultures, so to speak, is it's because people, you haven't transformed human nature, you've just made the way we choose things differently. So the problem is that collective, economic collectivism always, society-wide, I should say, economic collectivism, always results in violence and authoritarianism. I mean, it always does. It's a feature, not a bug, right? Because if we're gonna say there's no private property, then we're gonna to have to put people in charge. You're gonna do this, you're gonna do this, you're gonna produce this, you're gonna manufacture this, you're gonna be a scientist, you're gonna be a farmer. We have to tell people what to do. Well, what happens when people don't wanna do what the state agents tell them to do? Well, then you have to use force, right? And so you can look at like old examples of 80 years of central planning in the Soviet Union for lots of unfortunate and immiserating examples of this, but even looking at what's happened in Venezuela over the past couple of decades, which is they've gone from lots of economic freedom, a good path towards democracy, and now they've lost both, right? And the reason that they've lost both is because they've decided to collectivize economic resources. And when you do that, violence emerges and you have to use more force. So that's a really, really important question. Um, I think that it's impossible to have long-term economic success when you collectively own resources. Um, because you don't have the things, the three things that I said make markets work, you do away with them in collective societies. Prices, property rights, profits, and losses. I mean, the first rule of a collective a collectivist society, excuse me, is to eliminate private property rights. And the reason that's done is because we're taking away your agency and now you have to do what we tell you to do, right? And that's where the force comes in. So that's a really important question. Um, Okay, this is a great question from an anonymous attendee. What do you think robots or advanced machines taking control of or producing assembling products will do to the economy? Great question. Remember how I talked about creative destruction, right? So creative destruction is this process by which through entrepreneurship, we destroy the old way of doing things. And we replace it with a new lower cost way of doing things. And robots and computers and machines are one way of doing that. And we've been doing that this since the dawn of time. So, you know, developing um, very primitive tools when you think about something like that in primitive societies, you know, um, these are technological advancements and they are useful because they lessen the labor load, 
right? Um, and so that's not that different than what we're talking about now. It's just that the rapid pace of technological innovation is very different than you know discovering the wheel or something like this. So there's been a long, slow process of technological disruption. So I understand why you're asking the question because I think we're at a time now where people are really worried about this and worried about the implications. Let me tell one little story and keep answer. It, it's in line with my answer. So I had to fly to San Francisco, and it was it was not too. Um, it was pretty close to when everything shut down. I think it was like one of my last trips in February of 2020. And I was in this you know, kind of fancy airport and I always, I'm a coffee person. So every time, you know, I travel, I always want to find the coffee shop in the airport terminal. And so I came upon this thing, this site, and it was basically behind the glass. It was a robot that made your entire coffee for you. And so you walked up to the, the, the touch pad and I ordered a latte because of course, you know, I watched it for like 15 minutes just in awe. And then I decided, okay, I'm going to order one and see if this is even good. And so I ordered it on the touch pad, I put my credit card in, it took my money. And then this kind of armed robot went to work. And so there's kind of the milk foamer process over here and the robot was moving arms around. It was like stationary, but the arms would move. And it would get, you know, it, it turned on the espresso machine. I asked for three shots of espresso. It did exactly what I said. And then it made this beautiful latte happen. And then it shoved it through a little like belt. And then I lifted up a piece of plexiglass and I took it. And I thought, wow, <laughs> the robots have arrived, right? So you're going to see more and more of that. You're going to see cashierless grocery stores. Um, Pete's Coffee is near my house. I went to one the other day. That's not one that I normally go to. And you couldn't even go to the barista. You actually are only allowed to order through the computer. And then the barista only hands you your food and your drink. They do not deal with money. They do not deal with the order. So this is constantly going to happen. And the pace at which it's happening is very fast. And so I think people are worried. Here's why I'm not worried, uh, at least not now. Um, human beings possess human reason, and that makes us very unique and different, and it's not replicable. We can't just replicate that in a machine. And so uh, machines are only as smart as, as we are, uh, actually less smart, right? They can only be as smart as the people who program them um, in, in a finite way. And so, you know, the things that are not going to be replaced by machines anytime soon, uh, there's lots of things, both services like a haircut, a haircut. So my friend Jay Richards, who's at um, Catholic University, has written about this. I think it's called The Rise of the Machines. So it's a great book if you want to learn more about it. Things that take thought and quick decisions, right? Like, well, because you have to consult with the person who's getting the haircut. Do you want a little more off the side? Do you want, right? So that's not easily to easy to replace that labor with a machine. But if you look at man American manufacturing, it's been a lot of machine replacement of human labor. And some people might be worried about that because they might say, well, I think this means that we're going to have less people working. We're going to have more unemployment. And what it seems to show is that we get a lot more productivity out of manufacturing. Um, and th certainly those people are out of a job in the short run, uh, but they have to find labor in the longer run. So I think one of the challenges as we continue into the 21st century is thinking about how we help people become technologically capable to enter into this world because computer efficiency and sufficiency is going to be required for people coming into the job market, especially people who have lower levels of education and skills. So the good news is that this huge burst in manufacturing productivity, which has occurred since the 1980s, has not also been in, accompanied by mass unemployment. And so the thing about robots and machines are that it takes a lot more people to make a machine. Um, the more sophisticated the machine is, the more people are required and the more parts and so the more labor overall. So actually machines create jobs, they create different kinds of jobs. So I think there are things to be concerned about, again, which is the technological capabilities of the you know, emerging workforce who are, who are gonna fill these jobs. I think we should be worried about that, but I don't think we should be worried about people not being needed anymore. I mean, we're, I don't know that we'll ever get to that, but we're certainly not close. Um, that's a great question. Okay, let's see. We are running a little, a little bit out of time, I think. But I have a little bit more time for some questions than what we can talk about here. Um, 
Okay. Kevin says, do you feel that the rewards of entrepreneurship outweigh the risks of it? And I think the answer to that, Kevin, is it always depends, right? What I mean by that is think about Shark Tank, right? So it's just, it's having an idea for how to do something or for a new product is certainly not enough. It has to be doable. Um, and there could be a lot of risk. So, you know, I think about where I am in my life. I have youngish children, 11 and eight. And so there may be an entrepreneurial opportunity that I could take that would be very, very high risk in terms of, you know, maybe it would fail and maybe I would lose my income. And because I have little children that we're caring for and raising, it might not be. The risk reward calculation might not be worth it for me, but talk to me in 10 years, right? When my children aren't dependent on me. Um, in the way that they are today, and, and it might be later. And so I think it's very time specific, product specific, um, innovation specific. So this is something that we always have to think about the calculation of, right? And it's very personal. If you have a low propensity or low tolerance of risk, there's a lot of entrepreneurship that you might not be willing to do, right? Because high risk often has high reward, but you have to take the chance. And like I said, even with the entrepreneurs that I talked about earlier, they failed many times um, before they succeeded. And so you have to kind of be able to keep going during the failure. And I think that's why um, a lot of people, you know, don't pursue it um, for ever, you know, or they'll, they'll give it a whirl and then they'll stop. So I think there's no one answer to that question, I guess. Um, Kevin. Okay, here's another question. Maybe this will be our last one. I'll let Grace tell me after we're, after we're done. Um, would the current economic system in the US be considered socialist or capitalist as the government, the central bank changes by lowering interest rates and in some cases gives money to companies under some circumstances and propping them up? So this is a giant question. Um, I'll do my best in the time that we have. So I would say that the United States is what's called a mixed economy, it's not pure capitalism. It's not socialism, it's a mixed economy in the sense that there's largely private ownership of the means of production, right? Entrepreneurs um, can put their bets on the table. They can come up with ideas, at least on, on paper, right? There's the opportunity to do that. But there's government intervention. And you're, you mentioned specifically when the Federal Reserve engages in changes in the money supply and in explicitly giving people loans. So I think that is an example of our modern Federal Reserve going beyond its mandate, right? Um, the, the Federal Reserve is supposed to be thinking about money supply and monetary policy, not too much fiscal policy. So I think kind of related to your current question, what the Federal Reserve is doing now with loans and things like this might be beyond their mandate. And I do think that lens can lend to unpredictability in an economy. Because what we don't want when we have government intervention in an economy, like I said, the United States is a mixed economy. So there's a lot of freedom, economic freedom, but there is intervention. So with my college students on, we met on Tuesday night and we talked about the regulatory um, structure in the United States and how this can really interfere with entrepreneurship because if there's a lot of regulations that entrepreneurs have to comply with. It can make it so expensive that they might not even be able to stay open or stay in business. And so what we don't want is whether it's through the central bank or through other government agencies, we don't want to create what I call winners and losers, right? We don't want to prop some people up and let some people fail because it really creates these perverse incentives for cronyism, right? And political favoritism and buying privilege and things like that. So I think we need to be really careful about those types of interventions. But I would say largely the United States is a mixed economy, still has a lot of economic freedom. If you look at the data, we're in the top 20. Um, I think last year we were number six or something. So that's pretty good. Um, ease of doing business, which is a World Bank indicator that kind of helps us understand entrepreneurship in different countries. We do pretty well. Um, but again, the last thing maybe I'll say, because I think your question is a good one, is none of these are guaranteed. Just because you have lots of entrepreneurship, just because you have lots of economic freedom, doesn't mean you get to keep that forever. So the policies that we agitate for matter very much about the future of our economies. So great question. Um, okay, Grace is telling me that um, we have to wrap it up. I'm sorry that I tried to get as many questions as I could, um, but you guys have great questions. I'm so glad that um, we could be together tonight and I hope I get to see everybody in the future. Grace, I'll turn it over to you if you have 
don't know if you have anything you want to say or if they're free to leave. Thank you so much, Anne. That was a fantastic session. I'm glad that we were able to get through so many questions. Um, I think that will conclude our session this evening. Thank you so much for, for joining us tonight, Anne. Uh, and I'll let you say good night. Yeah, my pleasure, guys. Well, thank you so much. I'm just going to really quickly, um, if I can type this, I'm just going to put my email. If you have, um, I don't know if you'll be able to catch it, but it's just abradley at tfast.org. If people have questions that I didn't get to or you want to talk more, please email me and I'll do my best to get back to you as quickly as possible. So hopefully I get to see everybody in person someday too. But you're free to go and thanks again for having me.